Well, church, I want to thank you for staying with me all the way through. Uh, you know, it's an unusual thing to have an online revival. But aren't you glad God's not bound by geography? Now, we're a little restricted right now in our movement and travel and all of that. But the Word of God is not bound. And we've had a great time in the Word of God. And I want to thank you for allowing me to come into your homes and taking the time to study the Word of God in this way. It is it's just thrilling that God's allowed us to do it. And I want you to open your Bible one more time to the little book of 1 John. You knew where we were going, of course. And I want to end where John ends his book. I want to finish with the closing truth that is found for us in 1 John chapter number 5. Now, there's so many great verses to preach from, so many wonderful things that I'd love to share. But I really believe that the last verse of the book is the divine exclamation point on the entire study. It is found in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 21. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Right where you are, I won't know whether you do it or not, but God does. Uh, right where you are, I want you to read the verse out loud with me. Would you please? So you've got your place. 1 John 5 verse 21. Let's re read. Ready? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's read it again. Ready? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Read it one more time. Read it like you mean it. Ready? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Let's see if we can quote it. Don't look down. Don't cheat. All right? God knows. Ready? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, why am I repeating it, repeating it? Because I'm trying to brainwash you. That's what I'm trying to do. And it's a good brainwashing. It's the washing of water by the word. I want you to get this truth so deeply embedded in your heart that it will be one of the continuing points of application that grows out of our time together this week in this revival meeting. It's fascinating to me that all of 1 John was for the purpose of helping people to find their confidence in God, be right with God, have assurance in the Lord, increase their faith, but he ends with a warning. Why, Why would it end this way? It almost seems an abrupt ending to the book, doesn't it? I mean, there's no salutation. There's no sign-off. There's no I'm praying for you. There's just little children. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Why? Well, I believe that the great danger is not that God's people won't get right with God. It is that we have a harder time staying right with God. In fact, getting right with God is very easy, very simple. The moment you look to the Lord and say to the Lord, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Forgive me and cleanse me. 1 John 1, 9, you're right with God. Isn't that glorious? In a, in a moment, in an instant. And yet the great struggle that I have, I can't speak for you, but the great struggle I have is not in coming to the Lord, it's in staying close to Him. And that's why He says to believers, little children, this is a family book, remember? Are you a part of the family of God? then that's you. This little children is not an age, it's a stage. It's a family term. It's a term of endearment. He says, look, the children that I love, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen to that. All God's people should say amen to that. And I know, I know the danger is we say, well, of course we believe that, but we're not idolaters. And we want to preach on everybody else's idols. Don't we want to preach on everybody else's idols? In fact, do you know what the greatest struggle for all of us is? identifying our own idols. I can spot your idol at 100 yards and tell you about it. You can spot my sin. We can point out the sin of those around us. But may I ask, when was the last time you really searched your own heart, excuse me, let God search your heart and reveal what has come between you and the Lord? What is an idol? An idol is anything that takes the place that only Jesus should have. In Paul's writings, he once said, I will not be brought under the power of any. He said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What's he saying? He's saying, look, there are things I could get by with. There are things I could do. There are things people would say. There's no problem with that. But if that thing takes the place in my life that only Jesus should have, if it has power over me that only Christ should exercise, then it has become the idol in my life. May I point out that idol starts with I, and that the great struggle in all of our lives is to identify our own self-centeredness, our own selfishness, the self-life that gets in God's way. And I want to pray right now, dear Lord, get me out of your way. Please don't let my sin hold back the blessing. 
Please don't let me stand in your way of what you want to do in this world. God says, all right, then we must tear down every idol and we must not only tear them down. Look at the verse, please. This is the continuation of it. We must keep ourselves from idols. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about when you're by yourself? What do you love more than anything? What do you enjoy spending your money and your time on? Uh, when you have moments alone, where, where do your thoughts and affections run to? Or how about this? When you're really discouraged and you're having a hard time, where do you turn for release? Where do you run to to find your relief and your escape? If the answer to those questions is anything less than the Lord, then it means that all of us have some idol in our life that must be dealt with. And friend, the only power that an idol has Remember, idols are dumb things. We'll see that in just a moment. They can't talk. They can't give back to you. They can't love you in return. Idols are dumb things. The only power the idol can have is the power you give it. So may I ask, have you given power to anything or anyone in your life other than Jesus? Uh, what's controlling you? What's consuming you? Uh, what, is, what is absolutely draining the life out of you instead of you being yielded entirely to the lordship of Jesus Christ? A little over a year ago, I traveled to India for a gospel crusade. It was an amazing trip, an amazing meeting. We saw hundreds of Hindus come to faith in Jesus Christ. Every night in a big soccer complex, a big open field, they would bust them in. They came out of the mountains from everywhere. And I preached through an interpreter. In fact, I was preaching in five languages at the same time. I wasn't, but the interpreters were. And my message was very simple. It was this, that there's one God. Not many gods, there's one God. And there's one mediator or go-between between that God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. And that Jesus was not to be added to their gods. They're happy to do that. No, no. But we must turn from those idols to the one true and living God. It was glorious. It was honest. It was glorious to see people when the gospel appeal was given by the hundreds, night after night, respond and say, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I'm willing to renounce all false gods and serve him only. Oh, it's thrilling to see that. I got on the airplane coming back from India. I was writing down some of my reflections and some of the things God spoke to me about. Of course, I was overcome with the thought of all those people being saved, overwhelmed to see that culture and the response of the people to the gospel and the truth. But the Holy Spirit dealt with me, flying over the ocean on my way home, and the Holy Spirit said to me, what about your idols? You see, it's easy for me to talk about the idols of those pagans, those, those little statues that they bow down to, or those little carvings on the corner of their house. But what about the things in my life that I allow to turn my affection and my attention away from Christ? What about the things in my life that take prominence when Christ alone is to have the preeminence? And what about those things in your life? Now, let me show you something. I want you to turn back in your Bible just a minute to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 for a second. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Here's what happens when a person gets saved. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Paul said about those who'd come to faith in Christ. He said in verse 9, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how, look at this, ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What does it mean to turn to God from idols? What does that mean? I think the answer is in the verse. Look at the end of it to serve the living and true God. Look, you turn from something that is death to someone that is life. You turn from something that is false to someone that is true. You see, idols only really exist in the imagination. They're not near as great as you think they are. They're like Baal. They can't answer you when you're in trouble. They can't answer your prayer and meet your deepest needs. They cannot do that. And so they exist in our imagination and we set them up in our lives. They're false they are cheap substitutes, and God says, turn from all of that and turn to the living and true God. Now, if you've been saved, that's happened. But let me show you something else. Go back a few more pages in your Bible, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He writes to another church. Now look at verse 14. See if this sounds vaguely familiar. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. <laughs> now watch this. He's not talking about now about the moment of salvation. He's talking about the Christian life. He's not talking to lost people who need to be saved. He's talking to saved people who need to flee from idolatry. Look, you turn from idols when you get saved, but you've got to run from them the rest of your life. 
I preach a message from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 called the paganism of God's people. And I tell you, it's easy to preach on everybody else's paganism. But the paganism, the wickedness, the darkness I'm most concerned about is the darkness in my own soul, the darkness in my own heart. Friend, you don't just turn from idols, but you must keep yourselves from idols. And so I bring you to this portion of Scripture to say to you, we're living in a society where people frequently have idols. Now, one of the most famous talent contests now in our country is called American, what? Idol. And people want to set up singers as idols and sports people as idols and business icons as idols. But it may not be a person like that in your life. It may be your family. It may be your job. It may be some thing that you've grown to love more than you love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to take the spiritual test tonight to get real, uh, to, to come clean with God. And let me give you a few thoughts. They all come from 1 John chapter 5. So go back with me there. You see, in the verses that lead up to verse number 21, God gives us not only assurance, He gives us some application. I love this. Now let's begin, if you will, in verse number 18. He says, We know, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Let me stop. Have you been born again? I hope you have. If you haven't, you must be born again. But if you've been born again, the Bible says you don't just go on living any way you want to. This verse doesn't mean that once you're born again, you never sin again. We all know that's not true, or 1 John 1, 9 wouldn't be in the same book. It means go on sinning habitually, content to live a life of sin, no regard for God. When you're born of God, you sin not. But he that is begotten of God, here's that same word, keepeth himself. And that wicked one toucheth him not. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. You see, the idol is not real, but the devil behind it is. That's right. The thing in your life that is just really a figment of the imagination of how great it is, the pleasure of sin that lasts only for a season, it's here and gone, that's not really real. But there is someone pulling the strings behind it that is real. So here's the first truth I want you to write down about our idols. Number one, would you write this down? Idols are a lure. They're a lure. Somebody's fishing for you. Somebody's baiting you. Who is that? It's the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And he uses lots of things. He dangles lots of things in front of us to try to lure us in. You know, the bad thing is that the devil has a friend in us. That's right. He's got a friend in you. It's called your wicked flesh. Neither one of them want to submit to God. And so your flesh conspires with the devil, and the devil knows that, and so he finds something to lure you away. That's where the word lust in this book comes from. He's luring you away. I know we got some fishermen listening to me right now. And even if you're not a fisherman, you'll understand this. And my grandpa taught me as a boy out on the farm in West Virginia at the pond how to use certain lures to fish. And certain lures were, were better at certain times than others. Certain lures were better for certain fish than others. Certain lures are better at certain depth than others. The devil knows all of this, and he uses the lure. Look, if that fish were smart enough to know somebody was on the bank pulling the line, he would never go after the lure. And if you can look beyond your lust and beyond your lure, beyond the temptation, and see the devil who wants to destroy your life and your family and damn the souls of men around you because you bring a reproach to Christ, I think it will change the way you look at your idol. And so, number one, idols are a lure. Here's the second truth. Look at verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, the key in verse 18 was the wicked one. That's the devil. The key in verse 19 is the whole world. So, you got the devil to contend with. Now, you got the world to contend with. So, watch this, please. Number one, idols are a lure of the devil. Number two, idols are in all of life. Everywhere you look, they're everywhere. The devil's going to make sure of them, and anyone and anything can become an idol. Now, hold on to your seat. It's not just bad things that become idols. Oftentimes, in the lives of good church-going Christian people, it's good things in the wrong place. Our priorities get so mixed up. I'm thinking that perhaps even right now, maybe what God has done by pushing the pause button in our society made us all sit at home is to remind us that we've fallen in love with the wrong things. We're in love with busyness. We're in love with our schedules. We're in love with our plans. We're in love with our jobs. We're in love with travel. And he says, let's just stop all that for a little while. We're in love with our sports. Let's stop all that for a little while. Let's love Jesus again. Let's love his church. Let's love our families. Let's love lost souls. 
And so I ask you, look at yourself. Do you see the world around you living in darkness, uh, serving their idols? Is it possible we've been corrupted that that has crept into our lives? Because idols are in all of life. A good thing taking God's place. Here's the third truth. Look at verse number 20, and we know. Do you see how each one of these verses begins with, we know, and we know, and we know. Do you know this? And we know that the Son of God has come and have given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, it doesn't say we know He is coming. We know that. Earlier in the same book, he said that. He says we know He has come. That's right, He has come. And notice what the Bible says. The operative word here is the word true. We know Him that is true. We are in Him that is true. This is the true God. I have written in the margin of my Bible next to the word idols, unreal, and next to the word true God, real. <laughs> Here's the third truth. Not only are idols a lure and idols are in all of life, but number three, idols are a lie. Sin at its root is just a lie. Why? Because the devil is a liar and the father of it. And what does sin do? Sin promises what it can't fulfill. And so the liar comes along and he promises lots of things, but he never lives up to it. Now the devil will give you all the best up front and it's all downhill from there. Let me tell you what idols are. They are the opposite of truth. They cannot meet your deepest need. They cannot satisfy. They cannot help you in your darkest hour. Only the true and living God can do that. Let me prove it to you. Go back in the Old Testament with me just a second to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is one of the great revival books of the Bible. Look with me at Habakkuk chapter 2 for a moment. Habakkuk 2 verse 18. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusted therein to make, look at, look at the expression, Habakkuk 2.18, dumb idols. Can I tell you every idol is a dumb idol? Now, of course, he's speaking here literally the fact they can't speak. Aren't you glad our God speaks? And when he speaks, he speaks the truth. But these idols are dumb idols. They're dumb in every way. They can't hear, they can't speak, they can't think, they can't do. They're dumb idols. Why do you want to serve a dumb idol? Why do you want to follow a dumb idol? Why do you want to love a dumb idol that can't love you back? On our way back to 1 John, stop off with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for just a minute. We were in 1 Corinthians 10 a moment ago. Look, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know, 1 Corinthians 12, 2, that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. You know, if we could see our lives like God sees them, I think we'd laugh and then we'd cry. We'd say, dear Lord, what's wrong with me following these dumb idols, being led away by dumb idols? I'm asking you tonight to give up your dumb idol and follow an all-wise God. I'm asking you to lay, di lay down that weak thing and come to the strong one. I'm asking you to put aside your unholiness and come to the holy God and say, dear Lord, I want to keep myself from idols from this day forward. Let's let today be a new beginning in all of our lives with God. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So look at the truths. Number one, idols are a lure. Number two, idols are in all of life. Number three, idols are a lie. And number four, the most obvious thing, look at verse 22, little children. Who's he addressing? Us. Would you write this down? Idols are not for little children. As a parent, there are many times through the years that I've said to our son or to one of our girls, especially when they're very young. Oh, that's not for you. Don't touch that. That's not for you. We know what's best, right? Uh, don't play with that animal. Don't touch that light socket. Don't pick that up. Don't step in front of the lawnmower. Little children, that's not for you. But all wise, all loving, all powerful Heavenly Father looks at us and says, Little children, little children, those things aren't for you. God's not trying to keep some good thing from you. God's trying to keep you from some evil thing. Idols are not for little children. Remember this is a family book. Some things shouldn't be in God's family. Some things aren't to be in God's house. Some things shouldn't be named among the children of God. And may I ask you, is the Holy Ghost putting His finger on anything in your life right now? Then little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's an amazing thing, but the true and the living God has a power and glory whether we acknowledge it or not. That's right. If you don't honor Him, He still is a God of all glory. 
But idols only have the power and honor that you and I allow them to have. And I ask you again, is there any idol in your life, anything or anyone you've allowed to distract you and detour you from just loving God and following Him with all your heart? I'm back in India now. I'm standing there on the last night with my Bible open, preaching the Word of God. (laughs) We gave the invitation. It was a wonderful night. People being saved everywhere, being dealt with by counselors everywhere. We got near the end of the invitation, and I lifted my head, and I looked up, and standing in front of me was an elderly woman, way up in years, and she was a Hindu woman. She had on the traditional Hindu garb. She was dressed in all white. She was a frail-looking woman, and she was standing there just staring at me. She didn't speak my language. I didn't speak hers. And uh, others had not seen her, and so I said, the interpreter's next to me, I said, Ma'am, I'm so happy you've come, and he repeated it. I said, I want one of the ladies to sit down and show you from the Word of God how you can know the true and living God. One of the lady counselors came and took her by the hand and went off to the side, and I didn't see them again. The next morning at our prayer meeting and our meeting that morning, one of the people said, Did you see? Did you see the elderly Hindu woman that came forward last night at the end of the meeting? And I said, Yes, I saw her. And he said, Do you know what happened? I said, No, I didn't know who she was. I thought she didn't understand. He said, Oh, she understood. We were meeting in a place called Virapandi. This woman had lived her entire life in Hinduism with many different gods and lots of idols. At the end of the invitation, she came forward alone. She came forward standing there at the front. And when the counselor met her and took her off to the side, the woman said to the counselor, What is his name again? What is his name? And the counselor said, Who, the minister, the, the, the man who was preaching? She said, No, no. The one he was talking about, the true God, he came to earth. What what is his name? And the lady said, oh, Jesus. And the woman lit up and she said, yes, that's his name, Jesus. The counselor began to explain to her why Christ had come and what Christ had done for her. And the woman interrupted and said, I already know. I already know what I want. I want, and she said it this way, the God of Virapandi. That was the place where we were preaching and holding the gospel meeting. She said, I want the God of Virapandi to be my God. And that night, that precious woman was wonderfully saved. And I wonder if all of us might stop now. Maybe you've been a Christian for many years and we might say to God, Oh, I want the God of the Bible alone to be my God. I want the Christ who died for me to be my Lord in every area. I want the one who rose from the dead and reigns on high and is coming again I want Him to rule and reign in my heart. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. I wonder, can you lend your amen to that? Can you say in your heart, amen to that, amen to that? I want to close with one other portion of Scripture. Turn over just a couple pages in your Bible to the little book of Jude, will you? You're just a page or two away, the next to the last book of the Bible. Let me show you something interesting. Somebody says, well, how do you keep yourselves? Look at Jude, verse 21. The Bible says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Remember our last meeting, our last message, to love the Lord, to be captured by His love. Watch this. Stay close to that love. Stay in love with Jesus. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Let me tell you how to keep yourself. Stay in love with Jesus and keep your eye on the sky. Keep your heart in tune with God and keep looking for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Little children, keep yourselves from idols and watch. If you'll do your part, God will always do His. Look at verse 24. Now, unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Can I tell you this? Watch this. Do we keep ourselves or does the Lord keep us? Yes. We can't keep ourselves saved. Thank God God keeps us saved. But we can keep ourselves close to Jesus. We can keep ourselves in the love of God. We can keep ourselves looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We can keep ourselves from idols. And if we will do that, God says, I'll keep you from falling. Only God can keep us from falling. 
But I promise you on the authority of the Word of God, I know this, I'm sure of this, my friend, that God is able to keep you from falling. God is able to preserve you to the very end. God is able to keep you clean and right to the day we bow the nail-pierced feet of Jesus around the throne of heaven and rejoice together. Aren't you looking forward to that day? Well, God will keep you to that day. But our part, little children, keep yourselves from idols. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes with me right where you are for just a moment. And I want to be still and quiet for a second and ask you, let God search your heart. Let the Holy Ghost speak right now. Is there anything between you and Jesus? Anyone? May not be a bad thing, maybe a good thing. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Anything between you and the Lord? Let's start there. If you're not a Christian, your sin is between you and God. Would you call on Him right now and say, Lord, I'm a sinner? Right now, from your heart, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want you to be my Savior. Forgive me and cleanse me. God will answer that prayer. God will get your sin out of His way. Praise God for that. Maybe you're a believer, but you're not where you need to be. You're away from God. Would you say to the Lord like that, like that prodigal when he came to himself, would you just say, Father, forgive me. Father, I've sinned against you. The Father, the loving Father, He'll meet you right where you are, friend. He'll run to you. And maybe you're a, a leader in the church. You're a servant. You're a soul winner. You're a faithful Christian. Wonderful. That's not my question. My question is, is there any little idol that's been set up in your life? Anything God's putting His finger on, confess it to God, call it by name, give it to God now, lay it at His feet. Lord, this is not worthy of a Christian. This is not worthy of you. Take this from my life. Do business with God. I want to end a little different tonight. I hope you don't think it's strange. I really do because I'm, I'm very sincere about this. I'm going to ask you if you'll make an altar right in your home, wherever you are right now. Some of you are not physically able to get down on your knees. And if you're not physically able, God understands that. So do we. So you pray in whatever posture you need to be in. You just bow your head and your heart before God. But I'm going to ask everybody that's listening and watching right now, if you're in a place where you can get down on your knees, I'm going to ask you to do it right now. As serious as you can. Maybe the whole family is going to bow together. But I'm going to ask you to kneel at the couch, the coffee table, beside the bed. Wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to bow your knees and I'm going to ask you to go to the throne of God with me. And I want us to make this our prayer tonight. That God will keep us all from falling and God will help us to keep ourselves from idols. I want you to pray right now for your pastor, for your church. I want you to pray for your family, those you love. And I want you to pray that God will hedge us all in and keep us right where we ought to be until Jesus comes. Can you join me in that prayer? Our Father... Right now, as people are praying, wherever they may be, we know that all of our prayers are ascending to the throne room of heaven. And I just rejoice you're hearing every one of them and you're answering them, Lord. And we're agreeing together in prayer right now. Oh, God, do something out of the ordinary with our lives. Keep us from falling, Lord. We've sought this week to let the Lord speak to us and let the Word deal with us and let the Spirit search us. But now, Lord, we want to stay right. Help us to continue in obedience, to continue in the love of God, to continue living the life of victory. Help us to keep ourselves from idols. Father, I pray for Pastor Landrum and his precious family. Strengthen them. I pray for the church there. Hedge them about. And I pray for every family represented in this season of prayer right now. Oh, God, get everything out of our households that shouldn't be there and put everything in that should be there. And until we see Jesus face to face, we trust you to keep us. And we praise you for it in faith. We love you. And thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, church. I really mean this. Thank you for letting me share the word of God with you through this means. And thank you for studying it making it your own. And I want to challenge you. Get into 1 John for yourself. Spend a few days here. It'll do your heart good. At least the next five days, a chapter a day. I think it'll help you to pray your way through it and let the Lord continue to search your hearts. Uh, Pastor Landrum, I want you to know I love you, love your wife, your family. I thank God for your faithfulness there in that wonderful church. I praise the Lord for what God is continuing to do through your church in that place. 
And I thank you for praying for me and encouraging me. And uh, I look forward to being back with you face to face. Jesus may come before that happens. If so, we'll have a better meeting in heaven. We won't miss anything here, I promise you that. But the Lord tarries is coming. And we all live. I look forward to being with you sometime soon. And until then, pray for us and know that we're praying for you. I hope you'll go to our website, scottpauley.org. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear some reports of what God's done even through this message and through these meetings we've had. And uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, Listen to the podcast every day. If I can help you some way, I'd love to do it. God bless you, church.